First story. OP's best friend slept with OP's sister, who had just turned 18 and was grieving the loss of both her parents. The friend then lied, claiming it was consensual, so OP called him a creep and cut ties with him. Now, his parents and friend are harassing OP. It turns out the friend drugged the sister and sought her. Repost since I remembered Cole had read it and deleted it before realizing I didn't give a f if he saw it. Hi Reddit. I'm honestly at a loss right now and need some outsider perspective. So my 27F parents died in a car accident a few months ago. And now my sister, Lily 18F, is staying with me at my apartment. I love having Lily here. I didn't get to see her as much after I moved to the city where we're currently living and my job. It was much smoother transition than I expected. I reintroduced her to my best friend, Cole 27, almost right away, and they seemed to get along fairly well. My sister's birthday was in July, and the night after it, she went to a new 18-plus club that opened in our area. I didn't think much of it and just wanted her to be safe. After that night, Lily seemed more stressed, and I assumed it was because of her first year at college coming up. She's taking online courses for the first year and just tried to give her advice on how to handle it. Yesterday, after Cole came over to drop off some brownies he had baked, my sister came up to me with tears in her eyes and admitted that she had bumped into Cole on the night after her birthday, and they ended up sleeping together. I was shocked, but from how sad and ashamed Lily seemed, I asked if Cole had taken advantage of her. Lily said no, and that it was 100% consensual, but Cole asked her to keep it a secret. Lily didn't want to stress me out, and was afraid of me being mad at her, but she couldn't hold it in much longer. After reassuring Lily that I wasn't mad at her, and that she was completely right for telling me, I went to my room and angrily called Cole. I yelled at him over the phone and told him how creepy it was that he f ed my freshly 18-year-old sister, and that he was way too old to be messing around with girls her age. We went back and forth for a bit before finally hanging up, and I went back to talking to Lily about this. Cole told his family and our mutual friends what happened. During the night, and even this morning, I've been bombarded with texts from them saying that I was an arse for calling Cole creepy, and that since it was a consensual actual encounter with Lily being of age, it shouldn't matter. I haven't shown Lily the texts. I don't want to make her feel worse than she already is. With how consistent everyone has been with calling me an arsey hole, I'm wondering if I really am. So, am I the arsey hole for calling my best friend creepy for sleeping with my little sister? Edit. Yeah, I realized I made it sound like Cole and Lily only met after our parents' deaths, but she has known him before. Granted, they didn't talk much to my knowledge back then since she was a kid, and I didn't include her in what I was doing very often. Edit 2. It's just Cole's mom, dad, and brother who are harassing me about this outside of our friends. And at this point, I think that he might have twisted the story for them to get this riled up over what I said. Update. Hey Reddit. These past four days have been busy but I'm back with an update. To start off, I ended up talking to Lily about what happened that night, and she ended up revealing that shortly after I reintroduced Cole to her, he began texting her, saying he wanted to help her grieve. Lily had told Cole about her plan to go to that club, and by the time Cole had shown up, she was decently tipsy. Lily had woken up in Cole's bed the next morning, and after he had woken up too, he told my sister to lie about what happened by saying she was at a friend's house because I would consider it to be a betrayal of my trust, if I knew they slept together. After further discussion, Lily and I decided that grief counseling was best for her. Lily said that she regretted not getting it at the start, because, to her, that's what started this. As for Cole's family and our friends, I decided to ask them what they were told by in two separate group chats. I was effing right that he didn't tell them what actually happened. Both his family were under the expression that Cole and Lily had told me already what happened at first, and that I seemed okay with it. But when Lily wanted to talk further, I blew up on him out of blue. I told them what actually happened, and while Cole's family seemed hesitant to believe me, they'd said that they would talk to Cole. As for our friends, they believed me, and while some apologized, some were saying that it shouldn't have been an issue in the first place because my sister was legal, so I had to drop those people. I've blocked Cole, and I haven't confronted him further, but I'm preparing myself for the worst when I do. Also to clarify some things, I'm a woman first of all, and second of all, I don't think Cole had ever romantically liked me the past 15 years of us being friends. There just hasn't been any sign of that. But then again, this proves that I don't know him as well as I thought. Thank you all for the advice, and I'll update you again if anything more comes out of this. Update. I wanted to post an update a few days ago, 
but I felt emotionally and mentally exhausted. Per your guy's advice, I asked Lily if she actually remembered having as ex with Cole, and she said that she remembered Cole buying her a drink. Later on, Cole convinced Lily and her friend, who was tagging along with her, to let Lily go home with him. Lily remembers getting in the Uber and being inside of Cole's living room and bedroom, but not the SX itself. I mentioned that it's possible Cole drugged her with that drink, and if he did, then it's rope, and Lily can press charges against him. Lily said if he did, she would want to press charges against Cole. We both got a bit emotional afterwards, and I apologized to Lily for not noticing that something was wrong when it first happened. As for Cole's parents, they threatened to cut him off financially if he didn't tell them the truth, and Cole admitted to what Lily said in the first post. Cole's parents apologized to me over the phone call, and I told them what Lily said, and if he did drug her, then there's a possibility that we'll press charges against Cole. They seemed to accept that and apologized one more time for harassing me before hanging up. Also while clearing my phone of Cole related things pictures, videos, calendar dates, etc. I remembered a time when he was picking me up for a concert when we were 18-19. He looked at my outfit when I got into the car and mentioned how easy it would be for someone at the concert for them to rip it off and take advantage of me. I'll be honest. I was far more timid and more afraid of confrontation. So despite feeling weird about his comment, I brushed it off so we wouldn't fight over it. So there's one red flag I missed and regret not saying about it. Like I said in the last update, thank you for all of your support and advice. I'll update you guys if anything major comes up. Edit. Oh, and I'm changing all my passwords, probably my apartment door lock too that Cole has access to. Just in case he tries anything. Second story entitled cheating father, who neglected and abused me all my life with his new wife, his affair partner, feels he is entitled to the house I inherited from my grandparents who actually cared for me. He demanded that I let him and his spoiled family live there, so I refused, causing them to become homeless. Now, everyone calls me an arsy hole for showing resentment towards old people. I 30F and my father 64M have historically had a rocky relationship. My parents divorced when I was five and he married the woman he cheated on my mother with. I was an only child, and she had four kids from a previous marriage. During my childhood years, I spent most of the allocated time dedicated to my father in the divorce with my paternal grandparents. Every two weeks and 42 days in the summer, they lived in a different state. I cherished the time I had with them, and they would always go to bat for me. There was some tension caused early in my dad's new marriage due to my stepmother demanding that my GPs go back to the store one Christmas and get an equal amount of gifts for all of her children, even taking some from me gifting to her youngest. I spent many times waiting on my mom's sofa waiting for my dad to pick me up, and he never did. I would later find out he was on family vacations with his new family. I could spend all day telling Cinderella stories, but I need to keep focus on this story. My grandparents picked up his slack. We spent summers learning how to make baskets, gardening, camping, and various other activities. Their home was a second home to me. When I was 13, I went to go live with my dad after some methodical brainwashing, and I then would rarely see my GPs. My GM would call, and they would ignore it. It would hurt my heart to see it on the caller ID, knowing they were just on the other line. But my dad and SM would not allow it, unless I sat at a table with them, while on a call. Fast forward to the summer of my freshman year. We went to visit my dad's side of the family. On the last night, my aunt and uncle who lived next door asked if I could stay the night with my cousins. My SM wanted her youngest daughter to be included. They declined because my SS was a thief. A fight ensued in the front yard that night, resulting in physical altercations. My stepmother shoved my 74-year-old pap to the ground. He had a hip replacement in the 90s and already had a stiff walk. I was utterly terrified and distraught. As the chaos ensued, I packed my belongings because they said we were leaving. I vowed then that this would be the last straw and I would never forgive them. We missed their 50th wedding anniversary because my stepmom was still upset over what his family did to her that night. The next spring my pap had a stroke, and it was never the same. The man that helped raise me during his son's shortcoming didn't remember my name. He died in 2014. Later, I left home when I was 18 to go to college, where I met my husband. He has been my rock and helped when my dad throws fits in the last few years when he doesn't get his way. He has shown me nothing but unconditional love and support and is the father to our child. Mine never could muster to be. I go no contact with dad every couple years because of his behavior. There is an old saying that, time heals all wounds, but I don't believe that to always be true. 
I maintained a relationship with my mammy paternal grandmother until her death in December. She was a cheeky one who left notes for us to find after death. This woman never forgot a thing when she felt slighted. That was also reflected in her will. I inherit the house that has been deeded to me since 2001. My dad knew they would give it to me. But I honestly think he thought he had a chance of fighting me for it. Since 2012, he and my SM have been living in an RV that is now starting to fall apart. He is retired military and has no savings. Right after the funeral, he stashed his belongings in closets. I discovered this after I changed the locks and added cameras as I live out of state and wanted security for the home before I sell my house and move into my childhood home. I put his stuff and what was owed to him in storage, and my uncle gave him the keys. After learning this, he's been furious. My stepbrothers keep reaching out, telling me I'm heartless for keeping him out of his parents' home. He called crying, and I coldly told him if they wanted him to have it, they would have left it to him. I also told him he should have treated his parents better when they were alive. I have the deed in my hands, and there's nothing left for him to do about it. The estate is almost settled, and what land he does get will also have my name on the deed. I would rather share my childhood home with my daughter and all the whimsical things it had to offer. Even if my dad ends up homeless. Update. I promised an update. It's taking me a long time to really sit down and gather my thoughts to update, or rather just really take in the reality of my situation. It's taken me 31 years to really see beyond the rose-tinted glasses of the relationship I thought I had with my father. I did cancel his flight. He did not help us move, but I did end up engaging with him to keep the peace. Quick recap. I inherited my grandparents' home. Father and stepmother wanted to move in. I said no. Dad then decides to leave the evil stepmother and reconcile. Wanted to temporarily move in with us. We said no. He was insisting on helping us move, and we ultimately said no. We are essentially estranged, and he's never really been a parent to me. Would rather love and bond with my three stepmothers and all their children than his only child and grandchild. I previously entertained reconciliation, only to be strongly dissuaded by my extended family and read it. A week before making the move, he did come to Kentucky and leave my stepmother, as he had said. How he did it was cowardly. She was doing laundry on their last day in Texas at their RV, and he got in her vehicle and split back to Georgia leaving her without transportation. Her children are angry. Once he got to their RV in Georgia, he parked the car, packed his truck and trailer, and headed to Kentucky. He spent a week here on his property next to my inherited home. I inherited his parents' house for those that do not recall. He was essentially camping in a small trailer. He would haul stuff in for flea markets and gun shows. He asked if he could use my water hose so he could shower, and I agreed. I have cameras outside, so I thought, what could it hurt? Well. Here's where I was wrong. I then get a call from him that water is pouring from under the house. I told him to shut the water off. The house has been having leaks since I took possession, as it's got 60-year-old plumbing that will be replaced with the sale of my home. I had my uncle come to confirm and then scheduled a plumber to come look at what needed to be done. This was just five days before we would get there with a moving truck from Florida to Kai. A pipe had split under the sink, and the water heater had busted during the winter. During this time a storm came through and the power went out. He found a key I had in a flower pot for the plumber and went into my home. When we got there, he told us he sprayed the yard for ticks, did pest control, and also cleaned and sprayed for pests inside the home. I was livid. I didn't react angrily because, at the time, it felt weird. I was questioning whether I was wrong, and he was actually wanting to be a dad to me after all this time. So I let it go. That illusion has since passed. We've been here since mid-June. And now I've discovered he's robbed us blind. He's denied it all, of course. Tape had been removed from an old chimney hole assuming looking for money. And green dishware has been stolen and put on consignment in town and at another local place 40 minutes away. Anytime we have a subcontractor out to give bids on the remodel, he just shows up and tries to hijack the situation. He talked to me like I'm stupid in front of my husband. That surprisingly didn't go well. My husband is as docile as it comes. But that was the straw that broke his silence in all this. My dad didn't take kindly to my husband telling him he needed to mind his own business and be respectful to his wife. He's now staying at one of his cousins in an RV. He's still moving forward with his plans to put a tiny home on the land that is nestled between me and my uncle. My extended family tends to avoid him like the plague, even with his repeated efforts to enter the fold. He showed up to their home on the 4th of July with a lawn chair to see fireworks uninvited, and they didn't ask him to leave. Sometime in July, 
We noticed my dad had messed with the propane heater. It no longer had the pilot light on, and the dial had been moved to 1, which is on the opposite side of the dial as the pilot setting. Either that was incompetence, or he was playing with fate with our lives. His granddaughter's life. He, of course, denied it. I am under the impression we are all in fear of his retaliation. My husband has no such fears and keeps threatening to go into the consignment that has my stolen glassware and making a scene. Honestly, I'm at the point that I'm just going to let my husband deal with him. I'm no longer emotionally exhausted and just annoyed. He shows up randomly with food, which I immediately throw away. The last one had a note on it for my daughter. I wish I had a happier update, but this is what it is. We close on the sale of our home next week and start remodeling soon. I've let my contractors know the situation, and he's not to be on the property. I feel bad having them in the situation. I'm worried he will vandalize the house my grandparents left me while we are in our rental. If I end up as a news story, no it's not a mystery, and no who is responsible. Third story. Call me a bad person, but I'm getting rid of my foster child who has been with us for the past seven years, as I didn't sign up for this. My mom did, and she is dead now. Firstly, please reserve judgment until the end. If you still think I'm bad after reading this, I won't stop you. I'm a 30-year-old man. My mom was a foster carer for the last 11 years before she passed away, and she made me promise that I would take over when she died. She had heart failure, but had lived for seven years after diagnosis. She had two foster children, John and Paul. John came to live with us when I was 19 years old. He was eight and had severe behavioral issues linked to his trauma. My world was turned upside down, but I very quickly grew to love him. Underneath the trauma and the difficulties, he was an amazing boy who I loved with my entire heart. He's now 19 himself and still lives with me. He just finished high school, and I have no plans to move him out until he is ready. John and I have a great relationship. On the other hand, Paul is 16 years old. He came to live with us when he was 9. Paul has severe special needs, and no matter how much I've tried, I just cannot connect with him in the same way I did for John. Whereas John's behavior needs never bothered me, with Paul they do. I find him frustrating, and I have to remind myself that he is only on the same level as a three or four year old mentally, and it's not fair that I get frustrated at him. When mom was still alive, she took on the main role of looking after Paul, and I supported her. Which was okay. But I knew that when she was gone, I would struggle with him by myself. I didn't sign up to do this. I didn't sign up to look after him for the rest of my life. I just didn't. Mum died six months ago, and I said to myself I would try. I kept Paul for all this time, but I just can't cope with him. I can't. I told my social worker that he needs to be moved by the end of the month because I just can't manage. I want to continue fostering, and I love being a foster carer. But I just cannot meet his needs, and it was different when mom was still alive. I feel so guilty because I made my mom a promise that I would care for him until he was at least 18. But I'm building resentment toward him, and it isn't fair on him. He deserves to have someone who loves and cares for him in the ways that I just can't. So yeah, call me selfish, call me scum, whatever. I deserve it. Relevant comments. Well it's dead no. Have you looked into state programs that could help with having a nurse or special needs caregiver to help with the burden? Uprooting Paul could hurt him even more, and he might be looking at you for support. Look into some programs to help and see what they say. If you need to move Paul, make sure you can discuss it with him. With him having a mind of a three, four-year-old, that does some real damage to him if you aren't careful. My condolences and good luck. Edit. The other commenters are providing good advice and words of encouragement. OP. I've tried everything, any and all resources and support there is. When he's at school, it's not too bad. He has a bus to and from school every day, and has a career who comes and takes him out for five hours each week. Plus, I have two days each month where he is sent to a different foster carer, so I can have some peace time. But even with the support, I can't manage it. I feel guilty for giving up, but I honestly tried my best. This doesn't mean I'm cutting him off completely. I'll still visit him sometimes, but I can't meet his needs, and I really tried. OP responds to multiple questions about sucking it in, and continuing with fostering Paul, and if there are any programs or residential homes that work with people like Paul. OP, no, don't worry. They already have a place for him in a residential home. I don't know if the system is different in different countries, but giving notice here on a placement isn't seen as the end of you fostering. And I didn't have to justify it beyond, I just can't cope luckily. 
because I would have broken down if I had had to find justifications for it. It's funny. My mom used to say that the agency would always have had a way harder time playing John than Paul. John has very mild learning disabilities, but they are mainly linked to trauma, and had very bad behavior even now linked to his trauma, even though it's way better than when he was 8 lol. He's given me black eyes and bloody noses, smashed my laptops and TVs, and there was never a point throughout all of that where I ever thought I wouldn't give up on him. I would foster another child like him in a heartbeat, and struggle to see why anyone wouldn't. To me, he was just a kid in a tough spot, and our love helped him. My mom explained to me that children like him are actually harder to place because people are less forgiving of behaviors without a cause they can physically see like an obvious learning disability. I really tried to extend that to Paul. Genuinely, I did. I just couldn't. It just didn't click. I can't do the care he needs, sadly. And it's gutting for me because I really tried. And even though, I don't know, I don't feel that intense love for him that I do for John. I would never want Paul to be put in harm or not cared for. That isn't how the foster care system works. Me being unable to cope with Paul, who has extreme needs, means I should never be able to care for potential tens of children that I can support throughout my lifetime. Because I cannot support one child. Severe send means that any potential foster children that I could support should what? Just continue living in residential group homes. Have a think about how that logic works for you. Me admitting I can't cope with one child means that tens of future children could go without care and love in your world. Does that make sense to you? He is already on the highest package of support, which is immense. And I am entirely grateful to my agency. But even with it, I'm not in a position to support him how he needs it, unfortunately. He already has a place in a residential home, and I will still visit him. I don't want to just move him there and pretend he never was part of my life. I'm not that heartless, at least. Update. Eight days later. It has now been a few days since Paul moved out. So I thought I would give a little update. Firstly, I want to thank everyone who took the time to read my previous post, and for those who offered support and understanding. It meant a lot, honestly. Paul has been placed with a new family who specialize in caring for children with severe special needs. I believe this is the best environment for him, and he seems to be settling in well. I am keeping in touch with his new carers, and they've assured me that he's receiving the care and attention he needs. At first, the house felt different quieter, but also emptier. There's a lingering sense of guilt, but I'm also more at peace knowing he's in a place better suited to his needs. John and I have had more time to spend together, which has been nice. We've talked a lot about everything that's happened, and I'm grateful for his understanding and support. I've also started seeing a therapist to help work through the guilt I have been feeling, and to help me grieve. Yesterday, my agency reached out, saying they have two little boys needing housing for a short-term placement. They said initially six weeks, but it could be extended. They are coming tomorrow, and I am excited. They're 9 and 11, and are coming directly from their birth families. This will be my first proper placement, so I would be lying if I said I didn't feel a little anxious. Thank you again to everyone who reached out. Relevant Comments SHRX Win. It sounds like everything is working out well for both you and John, as well as Paul and the kids. You're able to help now with these two and in the future. Good job taking care of yourself in this difficult time with therapy too. Blockert Blaped. So glad to hear you made the right decision. It sounds like you are very awesome. And I hope your new placement will be a good fit. Deba Coleman 1010. Good luck to you and all the boys. You did the right thing for you all. You tried. And it just didn't work out. And anyone telling you differently has never even come close to taking care of someone with severe disabilities. Thank you for watching the video. If you are interested in listening to these kinds of stories, we've got more in store for you. Simply subscribe to our channel. Hit the like button and share it with your friends.